Hello, and welcome to Senior Solutions, where we bring you topics affecting seniors and their loved ones. I'm your host, Mindy Fellenton. And one of the topics that I thought might be of interest is what are the changes that people have in their skin and their skin care and their needs as they are aging? And my guest today is Dr. Ronnie Ford, who's a dermatologist, and she is here to answer those questions and tell us about all of the wonderful things that we can do to prevent and treat our skins, um, particularly as they're, we're aging. Absolutely. So welcome, Dr. Ford. Thank and thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. And let's start out by talking about what are the changes that people experience as they age relative to their skin? Well, the most important thing that we see as we age in terms of, of what happens with the skin is that the skin becomes less capable of maintaining hydration. The skin becomes thinner. The fatty layer under the skin thins a little bit. The skin becomes more fragile. And um, the skin is, is more easily dried. And so what happens is people find as they get older that their skin becomes a little bit more wrinkly looking. It becomes a little bit more fragile and much drier. Um, older patients are, are more prone to eczema and they're more prone to, um, to dryness of the skin. So I want to just ask you a question. I sure. may sound like a smart aleck kind of comment, but for example, you said they're, they're losing the fat under the, the skin. Correct, the subcutaneous if, fat, that's right. If someone happens to be, um, have a few extra pounds on them, does mm -hmm. that affect that? No, ah. it does not, unfortunately. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> unfortunately, okay. right, right. Um, other things also affect the um, fragility of the skin and, and that would be sun exposure over the years. And of course, the older you are, the more sun exposure you will have accumulated. And so those two forces are somewhat additive. Um, but there are certainly things that we can do uh, to, A, prevent some of the changes that occur with our skin, especially those related to sun exposure, and B, things we can do to treat our skin as we age so that we're less symptomatic from some of the changes. So, so of course, what are those? The most obvious would be sunscreen. So um, if we start out at a young, as young an age as possible wearing sunscreen, we can prevent some of the sun damage changes that occur with the skin. And then... As we age, we want to make sure that we keep our skin well hydrated. So using gentle cleansers in the shower, taking shorter showers and showers that are not too hot, um, applying moisturizers right after taking a shower, drinking a reasonable amount of fluid every day, plenty of water. Fluid, does that include gin, vodka? <laughs> Usually <laughs> not. That's actually dehydrating. Okay. Um, but drinking water, several glasses of water a day, and humidity in the home, so a, a humidifier in the, in the bedroom or in the room where you spend most of your time. And those things will help to um, seal the skin's moisture barrier and help prevent the skin from getting quite so dry. Are there particular ingredients in products that you mentioned, like the cleansers and moisturizers, to avoid or to seek out? Yes, actually there are. Ceramides are um, ingredients in moisturizers which can help to repair the skin's moisture barrier and that will allow your skin, once you put a cream on that has ceramides in it, that will allow the moisture to stay. And also dimethicone is another moisturizer ingredient that gives you that feeling that the moisturizer is still on, although it's not greasy. So it's, it's a little more elegant vehicle in terms of, of using moisturizer. And ceramides, is that's something that you look, would look for You can as look an for it in the ingredients, correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, then on the, the cleansing component, is there something to look for or avoid in um, that? Well, sodium lauryl sulfate is a soap-related uh, ingredient, and that can be a little harsh on the skin. So looking for something without sodium lauryl sulfate, a non-soap a non cleanser or a gentle cleanser would be beneficial. Um, in addition to that, cleansers with moisturizers like body washes that you can use in the shower that have moisturizers in them give you a little bit of moisture and, and help you eliminate some of the dryness associated with the soaps. You know what I've noticed just personally in looking to get moisturizers mm -hmm. and or soaps or cleansing products mm -hmm. is the prevalence of alcohol or acetyl something. Right, right. In most products. Yeah. 
and I find that so counter. Um, it, it's it, not exactly the same as the ethyl alcohol, which is the, the type of alcohol that you, or isopropyl alcohol, rather, right, right. the type of alcohol that you find in the bottle of alcohol, which right. is very, very drying. Some alcohols actually are not necessarily drying. They just help to get the main ingredients into solution. Ah, okay. So they, they act as, as um, ingredients to coordinate all the other ingredients in the product. It's sort of the binding agent right. kind of Exactly. It, it helps the, the texture of the product, and it helps the in active ingredients get into solution. Okay. So it's not quite as drying as you would expect with the isopropyl alcohols. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because I'm feverishly looking at labels right, in, right. Cer in certain well, stores. There are, there are ingredients in um, products that people use called parabens. And parabens are um, they're preservatives. They are not necessarily drying, but they're considered allergenic to many patients. And so people who have very sensitive skin might actually want to look at the labels of the products that they buy for topical use and look to see if there are any parabens, something like methylparaben, because those are things that sometimes people do have reactions to. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so let's talk about some of the more prevalent diseases or conditions of the skin that we can anticipate as we are going through the aging process. Okay. Um, well, one of the things that, you know, people frequently think of when they are, are getting older is the um, potential for the development of shingles. Um, shingles is the reactivation of the chicken pox, and anybody can get shingles, but the prevalence is much higher as you reach 50 and above. Um, so anybody that's had chicken pox can, can develop shingles. It is a rash that occurs on one side of the body at a time, only one side. It develops in the area innervated by one nerve, so you can have a band across your abdomen and back. You can have a band down your arm. You can have a band down your leg. You can have it affecting your face. Uh, it is a blistering, painful eruption that uh, occurs generally out of the blue. Occasionally it occurs after an illness or chemotherapy or some form of immunosuppressant um, medication, but in many cases it appears out of the blue. And so what's the best or what is the treatment for that? Well, if patients feel that they have shingles or are concerned that they may have shingles, they need to see their physician as quickly as possible because there are antiviral medications we can treat patients with. And if those antiviral medications are started within 72 hours of the initial symptom um, development, we have a very good chance of being able to treat the shingles quickly, suppress it, minimize the chance of the one complication of shingles that everybody fears, and that is long-term discomfort. So shingles lasts about two to three weeks, whether it's treated or not. But if you can treat the patient quickly, you decrease the risk of long-term pain, and you can hopefully minimize the duration of their outbreak and, and make the outbreak less severe as well. And what about, I, I've heard this vaccine is out for shingles. You see the Correct. advertisements on the TV. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us a little bit about who is a candidate, who wouldn't be a candidate, and what is the effectiveness sure. um, in having received the Absolutely. So the, the vaccine is called Zostavax, and it is approved uh, by the FDA to be used in patients who are 50 years old and older. When it was initially approved, it was for 60 and older, but they've revised their um, guidelines, and now patients who are 50 years and older are uh, able to receive the vaccine. It is um, the benefit of the shingles vaccine is that it decreases the incidence of shingles by 50%. Wow, that's huge. Correct. Yeah, it's really, really tremendous. Um, oh, sorry. And, and the patients who develop shingles who have had the vaccine tend to have a much more abbreviated course, course and much less severe. So why is it, do they know that it's, a, what is it about the 50% of the people who it helps? Is there any known Nobody cause knows. of why it helps them and not the other 50%? No. Nobody knows. <laughs> she says Nobody no. Nobody knows. But I will say one other thing, and that is that 
people sometimes feel that once they've had shingles, they're not susceptible to getting it again, and they may feel that because of that, they don't need to be vaccinated, but that is not the case. You can get shingles more than one time. Generally, it would not be in the same dermatome or nerve distribution, but you can get it more than one time. So if you've had shingles at a relatively young age, you still would be a candidate for the vaccine because you would try to minimize your chance of getting it for a second time. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, the people who should not get the shingles vaccine are people who are immunocompromised and who are taking some types of immunosuppressant medications. And so patients would want to speak with their physicians and to make sure that, uh, that there are good candidates, give their physicians or make sure their physicians look at their medications and um, let them know if any of the medications contraindicate the shingles vaccine. As with, I guess, most medications that they should do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and what are some examples of immunos? Uh, like so some of the biologic medications we're using right now for um, ulcerative colitis, for psoriasis, Humira, Embrel, those are medications that suppress the immune system a little bit and they may affect the patient's ability to um, mount a response to the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So those patients would want to if they're going to be started on those medications, you would actually want to try to give them their shingle shot a month before they start the medication. And if they're on the medication, they would have to wait until they took a break from the medication. And how long of a break would they have to take well, from medications? From the medication, depending on the medicine, because they have okay. different half-lives, a month or longer, depending on the medication. There's a medication called Stellara, which is administered once every three months. It has a much longer half-life. You would have to be off of that medication for at least se several months before you could have a shingles vaccine. It was very helpful to, to have Thank a you. better understanding of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let's go back to the moisturizer and the different things that people should do because if I understand correctly from what you are saying earlier, that the skin dries. Mm -hmm. And moisture use of sunscreen would be something that you recommend and recommended that Absolutely. people do as, as early as possible to start that process. Correct. And I'm assuming that there are some sunscreens that will act as both? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, there are. There are moisturizers that have sunscreens in them, and they will be obviously labeled as such. So you can take a look. A lot of the major manufacturers of um, moisturizers and sunscreen products um, do have moisturizers that have sunscreens in them, both facial moisturizers and body moisturizers. Ah, yes. and I'm glad that you said that, the body, because mm -hmm. I was thinking as you were talking about this, you know, I always think about face, 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 and oh, by the way, yeah, there's there's other skin. Right. So people who live in different climates and different areas of the country, mm -hmm. it, is it any different as far as also protecting, using sunscreens to protect their bodies as well? In other words, if somebody lives in Florida or they live here, would you recommend anything different as far as putting sunscreen on your body, not just your face? Because that's, yeah. I just think about my face. Absolutely. Well, what I usually tell patients is protect what's exposed. So obviously, if you are in a warmer climate and you're going to be wearing short sleeves, shorts, skirts, and, and have skin exposed, your legs exposed, your hands, your arms, you would want to protect those neck and chest as well. You would want to protect those sites with sunscreen. If you are in a more northern climate and it is winter time and you are covered, then your clothing acts as a barrier to the sun. You don't have to use sunscreen in areas that are covered with, with sun protective clothing or with clothing that's a, a tight knit. Um, so yes, there is a difference between what, I, what you recommend to people based on, on how much skin is exposed to the sun on a daily basis. Great, mm -hmm. all right. Well, we're gonna take a short break and we will be right back. Hart, what's going on? I'm leaving. Why? What did I do? Not enough. You constantly ignore me. You barely eat anything healthy. You're half as active as you used to be. The pressure is just too much. I quit. Okay, I get it. I'll do better. Just please, don't leave. Okay. But remember, if I go, you go. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. 
Welcome back to Senior Solutions, where we bring you topics affecting seniors and their loved ones. And I'm your host, Mindy Fellenton, and we're joined today by Dr. Ronnie Ford, who I failed to mention is a practicing dermatologist in Montgomery Village, um, in Montgomery County. So we're Correct. delighted to have you here. Thank you. And this has really been very informative uh, thus far. And uh, I wanted to talk with you a little bit more about what the appointment would look like when someone comes in for a checkup. Okay. Well, we schedule patients in our office for full skin checks. And what that entails basically is um, we have the patient come into the office. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have them undress and leave, leave some of their undergarments on. They have a drape sheet, and we actually check their entire skin surface. Um, I start usually with the face. <clears throat> check, actually, I start with the back, check the back first, have the patients lay back, check their face, check their arms, check their neck, chest, abdomen, below the waist, legs, in between the toes, bottoms of the feet, the patient turns over, we check their back, the buttocks, and the backs of the legs. The other area that we check is we check the scalp. And obviously in a bald man, we can see the scalp surface very easily. In a woman or somebody that has a lot of hair, I do part the hair and try to look through the scalp as best as possible. But I always tell the patients that because of the hair, sometimes it's hard to see everything in the scalp. And I ask them to enlist the help of their barber or their beautician so that when their hair is wet, they can see if they notice anything that's pigmented then they can alert the patient and the patient can alert us. And ears, and <coughs> yep. behind the ears? Behind that's... the ears, in the ears, not in the ear like an otolaryngologist, but the surface of the ear that you can see that would have been exposed to sun. And mm -hmm. have you had experience with patients who you've, for whom you've performed a body check and how fortunate because you found something that was treatable? I have, I have. I, I actually... Um, had a patient who comes in for full skin checks every year and um, he comes in because his wife was diagnosed with a melanoma 20 years ago and so he has become um, in the habit, gotten in the habit of scheduling a yearly skin check and he was here just a few months ago. We did a complete skin check and I noticed an unusual pigmentation in the um, external portion of his ear which he had not been aware of. It, it's difficult to see that location on yourself. So um, I did a biopsy of it. I removed it and it came back to be a non-invasive melanoma, which means it's a melanoma that was very early. And if you can make the diagnosis of melanoma at an early stage before it's become invasive, it does not have a chance to spread. And, and basically you can tell the patient they're pretty much clear of that melanoma. The chance of recurrence is almost zero. And what is the process to treat that? Well, melanomas are treated surgically. And the way that you treat melanoma is determined by how deep the melanoma is. So if you have a non-invasive melanoma, you do something called an excision, where you cut out the melanoma using a certain number of millimeters margin around the lesion. So you make sure you get the entire melanoma plus some of the surrounding skin. Mm -hmm. There's a, a type of surgical procedure called Mohs micrographic surgery. Right, I've heard of that. That is a procedure where the melanoma or other form of skin cancer is removed. It is looked at under the microscope while the patient is still in the office to make sure that there are no cells left behind. And um, that has a very high rate of cure. That is done in areas where the melanoma or other skin cancer is in a cosmetically sensitive area or an area where there's not a lot of extra skin and you can't take a large margin around it. With melanomas that are invasive, the depth of the melanoma, and that is determined by the pathologist. When you send your specimen to the pathologist, your report comes back with a number of informative uh, criteria, one of which is the depth. And the depth determines how much of a margin you leave around the melanoma before you excise it. So a thin or thinner melanoma, which is less than 0.7 millimeters, um, which is about a um, quarter of an inch or less than that, is excised with a slightly smaller margin, 
and a deeper melanoma would be excised with a slightly larger, mel larger margin, mm -hmm. just to make sure that you didn't leave anything behind. Mm -hmm. In some cases with melanomas also, if they are invasive, the patients will also have a lymph node biopsy, and that lymph node is determined by injecting a dye into the area where the melanoma was, following it into the lymphatics and finding the first lymph node that picks up the dye to see if any cells have gotten loose from the melanoma, have penetrated into the lymphatics, and have spread. Oh, that's something I suppose we hope is a negative. Correct, correct. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So what is a good topical regimen that you recommend to decrease the likelihood of developing skin cancer? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, a number one would be sunscreen. Everybody should be wearing sunscreen every day. The American Academy of Dermatology recommends that patients wear an SPF 15 sunscreen or higher. Um, however, I usually try to recommend to my patients that they use an SPF 30 or higher because if you put sunscreens on too sparingly, you will not get the full SPF value out of your sunscreen. So if you put a 30 on the way most of us do, since we don't want to have any greasy products on our skin, you'll get about a 15, and, and that's adequate. Um, the other thing that you want to make sure you do with your sunscreen is reapply it. Sunscreens are only really fully active for about three hours. Oh, really? So, yes. Ah. So if you put your sunscreen on in the morning and you're going to be exposed to sun in the afternoon, you want to put more sunscreen on at the lunch hour, and that way your sunscreen will be more effective. So sunscreen every morning. There are two other topical products that can be utilized that can help both diminish the signs of sun damage and aging and help minimize you from getting additional sun damage and aging. The, the one that I the re recommend for patients to use at night are retinoids. Retinoids are vitamin A derivatives. You may recognize the name Retin-A, oh, which yes. is a prescription. Yes. There is also retinol, which is over-the-counter. And these are products that have been shown over time. It's gradual, but they have been shown over time to decrease the physical signs of sun damage, and they have been shown to decrease the incidence of precancers mm. in patients who use them chronically. Um, so retinoids are used at night. They are affected. Their, their activity level is affected by sun exposure, so you want to use them at nighttime when they'll be fully active. In the morning, after you wash your face, you, apl you can apply a, an antioxidant topical product, and that would be something that has vitamin C or vitamin E, um, kojic acid, um, peptides, coffee berry, coenzyme Q10. There are a number of different types of antioxidants. The antioxidants help to absorb the chemicals in your skin caused by sun exposure. And those are the chemicals that cause DNA damage that can lead to sun damage and skin cancers eventually. And then on top of your antioxidant, your sunscreen. Okay, that was really helpful. Thank you. Sure. I had no mm -hmm. idea about the, the retinoids, uh, the Retin-A. I remember from years ago, Dr. Kligman Correct. was the doctor who I used to go to Dr. a few Kl years ago. Right, who right. Who created that. Yes, he did. Dr. Kligman created something called Kligman's Formula, which was a combination of Retin-A, hydroquinone, and um, hydrocortisone to treat round discolorations on the skin. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's absolutely right. Yes. I was one of the test cases. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Lucky me. Um, what are the, there are these brown sort of scaly growths, for lack of a better word, right, that right. people tend to develop. Tell us about those, what they are and their causes, treatments, et cetera. Certainly. They're called seborrheic or benign keratoses, and um, we refer them to them in our office affectionately as wisdom spots because we don't like to say anything is age-related. But as we get older, we tend to accumulate more of these seborrheic keratoses. They're genetic. So there isn't a way that they can be prevented. We, we will get what we get based on our genes. Mm. You can get them as young as 30, but of course as you age, you accumulate more of them. Um, they're harmless. They can be removed if they are symptomatic. Uh, it is actually considered medically necessary by the insurance companies and by Medicare if they're bleeding, if they're itchy, if they're scabbing or crusted, or if they're impacted by clothing, seat belts, combs. 
Um, otherwise, they can be removed for cosmetic purposes. We usually freeze them with liquid nitrogen. Uh, they can also be anesthetized and removed surgically as well. And what would <clears throat> distinguish one that's removed by freezing versus one that's removed surgically? The depth or thickness of the lesion, the size. Okay. So if you have a smaller lesion, those are going to be more amenable to the liquid nitrogen treatment. If you have a larger lesion, it probably would be better for the patient to, to anesthetize it and remove it surgically because sometimes the nitrogen can't penetrate through the thickness of the larger lesions. And based on what you said, there's nothing that anybody can do to... No magic potions for those. No, it's, not it's in the genes. Yet. It's in the genes. It's all in the genes. Exactly. Okay, so they're not preventable. They're treatable. Correct. 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 And what other... Um, changes we can one anticipate as one becomes more wa full of wisdom mm -hmm. in addition to the drying and keratosis are there other wonderful things well, that we have to of course you know one of the biggest things that people complain about or or comment about when they come into the office is um, the aging changes that are visible on their face so of course you know we have brown pigmentation and we have wrinkles, and we have some loss of volume in the skin and in the tissues of the face. So, um, of course, these are cosmetic questions. They're not medical questions, but there are a lot of things that can be done for patients um, based on their desires and based on um, the changes that they've experienced over the years. We have laser treatments that can treat pigmentation. We have chemical peels. We have microdermabrasion that can improve the texture and the visibility of the skin. We have botulinum toxin, which can minimize frowning and wrinkles and crow's feet. We have fillers that can be injected into the grooves and lines to make wrinkles less visible. And we can improve the, the volumization of the skin by injecting deeper fillers into the skin. So the patients regain some of the facial volume that they had when they were younger. Are there, I'm assuming because you said that these are cosmetic things, that insurance doesn't cover it Correct. generally, but are there any circumstances under which uh, insurance might cover any of these treatments? Well, insurance occasionally will cover the use of botulinum toxin in a patient who has migraines. Um, botulinum toxin is FDA approved in the, for the treatment of migraines. And so occasionally we'll have a patient who comes in for, for botulinum toxin treatment of wrinkles, and they find that their headaches go away. So those patients can appeal to their insurance company and have potentially their treatments covered by, by their insurance to treat their migraines. The lucky side effect for them is that it will help the wrinkles as well. Yeah. <laughs> None of the that's, others are covered by insurance, unfortunately. Well, that's a real win-win. Yes, it is. Yes. This was so informative. Thank you very, very much for being here. And if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, Dr. Ford, how would they do that? We have a website. It's www.fordderm.com. Uh, or they can call our office. And the phone number is 301-977-2070. Great. Thank you again. This was really, really helpful You're and welcome. very informative. Welcome. And if you have an idea that you would like to see on Senior Solutions, please feel free to email me at SeniorSolutionsTV at gmail.com. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.